moving right along, you might say. <laughs> uh, okay. Mid-season form already. Hello, welcome back to Cookie Pocket. I don't even know what season it is, but we're still here. We're chugging <laughs> along, just like the five. Electric Mayhem Band. Oh, season five. There you go. Um, and today we're discussing the original The Muppet Movie from 1979, in part because I really wanted to choose a Muppet film, uh, particularly to show to Mitchell, because I know Zach and I are very <laughs> um, deeply Muppet-versed, but Mitchell less so. So I wanted to have this <laughs> conversation. And I hadn't seen the classic in a long time, despite being a, a big fan of the Muppets myself. But uh, I'd love to hear your your ratings and out of five. And, and before we get too ahead of ourselves, how are you two doing today? Doing fine. Doing doing a okay. I've been freelancing for about a year now. Uh, you can't see next to me, but there's an enormous pile of empty boxes. I'm drinking a, a cherry Coke, so I am maybe the most unemployed <laughs> I've ever been in my life right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mitchell's doing okay, too. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Um, aliens are real. Uh, nuclear destruction is imminent. <laughs> Russia and China and Iran and North Korea are, are going to war with us, and this is unclassified. <laughs> that's all i have to okay. say okay next up the news at 10 <laughs> uh, any given thursday right yeah <laughs> well i'm doing well too <laughs> 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 and i gave the muppet movie four out of five stars and was very pleasantly surprised by it i think the first time i watched mm -hmm. it this is an approximation but it was on a library dvd and <laughs> probably in elementary school, maybe in middle school. And I didn't love the Muppets then as much as I do now, and I didn't really understand a lot of the in-jokes, uh, such as when Kermit crashes his bike and he says, uh, gone with the Schwinn. I had no idea what that meant as a child, <laughs> um, among other things. The fourth wall breaks didn't always make sense to me either. But now I find it very funny and charming and paced in a way that is probably quicker than most late 70s, early 80s family films, but not so breakneck and, uh, I don't know, across the spider verse that I find it kind of exhausting. <laughs> and in particular, the humor, despite these fourth wall breaks and these sort of self-referential moments, and obviously the, the framing device of the Muppets watching the movie as we're watching it, mm -hmm. um, I feel like this sort of meta humor is, is extraordinarily common now, but I didn't find it exhausting in the way that I do in, in something that comes out of a studio now. It just felt really genuine. And at its heart, this is really Kermit's film. And I think that's why I love it so much. In pretty much all the other Muppet films, even the soft reboot in 2011 titled The Muppets, mm -hmm. which follows a fairly similar plot where he except that he's bringing the Muppets back together rather than bringing them together and going to Hollywood with them. Um, he's still kind of, I don't know, master of ceremonies and manager of them all and kind of heckling and managing things. And that, that brings its own humor too. But I think the uniqueness of this film being his film, first and foremost, is a nice touch. And of course, Jim Henson uh, plays it to perfection in my book. So four out of five for me. Yeah, I kind of as you as you made reference to Christian, I, I have a long running affection for the Muppets as well. But this watch for me, or I guess the past two watches of this film have been within a very different context, because when I was a kid, I mostly watched the Muppets Treasure Island and uh, Muppet Christmas Carol. Those were kind of the two classics. And then gradually I saw some of the older ones. But throughout college, I kind of made this group of friends where we were sort of bound together by the Muppets. Um, our first thing we ever did together, like as a group was at a birthday party, we were bored and two of us put on the Muppet treasure Island and then the rest <laughs> of us slowly like got into it and were really invested. <laughs> and then after that, we decided that every week we were going to get together on Friday and watch one of the Muppet movies, like in order. Um, and that's like wow. held the group together since we've like run out of Muppet movies at this point where we watch other films together. Um, so watching this film kind of with that given context, I've also gone back and watched 
a lot of the Muppet show as well. So the Muppets are a much more kind of ingrained part of my life than they were when I was a kid at this point. And it is interesting to see this film in that context, because I think compared to a lot of the other Muppet movies, this isn't necessarily the one that holds together the best as a movie. The direction is kind of clunky and the filmmaking isn't super impressive. Like a movie like Muppet Treasure Island, I think holds together as a very slick and professional adventure movie in a way that maybe the Muppet movie, Great Muppet Caper, Muppets Take Manhattan, the early ones really don't. Um, but I think that's because more than anything else, these early Muppet movies are, are not even, I'm not even going to compare them to, to close-up magic. They basically are close-up magic. And I think when when you're filming, like, when you're filming a magic trick, it's best to be as as basic and as unflashy as possible, because the more camera trickery that's involved, the more the viewer is going to think they're somehow being fooled by the image. And if you just film Kermit riding along on the bicycle, like it's the most normal thing in the world, <laughs> it appears to be the most normal thing in the world. And the viewer really doesn't think anything of it. Uh, and I think these original films, especially this one, really embody that kind of effort of of Jim Henson's uh, puppeteering. And also just the, the the general message about friendship and artistry, I think really resonates in this one, basic though it may be. A four out of five from me. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So back in the day, back in the old early O's of the 21st century, I watched Mr. Meaty. And Mr. Meaty <laughs> Mr. is Who? the closest thing <laughs> that... It's very obscure, Zach. It's On very Carson obscure. Network, right? Look, no, no, no. It's a Nickelodeon. Nickelodeon. Okay. All right. Um... It was very, I won't say it's raunchy, but it, for a children's show, I guess it was, uh, <laughs> there was a lot of wedgies and and stereotypes that were very funny. Okay. And also, when I was even younger, uh, Sesame Street, mm -hmm. which it took me a while to realize that this whole multiverse was connected and that Sesame Street was <laughs> in the Muppets universe, mm -hmm. the Muppets mm -hmm. Earth, as you will, uh, if you will. And... That is my that is my background. Uh, I feel like I had seen parts of this before, and maybe it's just because of memes, or maybe it's just because I randomly will come across like things about the Muppets, and then this movie will end up coming up. And I'll kind of pref well, I'll I'll preface by combining two of the things that you guys said. I'll say that with the technical stuff, having those wider shots uh, being very sparsely put throughout. And then having like those normal, like there's someone under the camera shots mm -hmm. moving the puppetry uh, is very effective and believable. And I'll play into what Christian was saying by talking about the like the self-awareness. Plus, there's also a sense of ignorance, which uh, ignorance of the time and where it would go. Like they weren't thinking that this would turn into what it did. And there's always that that blindness that adds much more nostalgia and value to it. Uh, knowing that there was a lot that they weren't considering when it came to how they were going to introduce these characters and and integrate them in the story, and I would basically just say like the the movie. I guess it's more like um, what we were talking about, um, Alistair McLean, uh, freaking um, where eagles dare, where Zach was <laughs> saying like everything's just set up to show oh, what's going on. Yeah, I feel like that style works a lot better here just because that they're puppets and like you were kind of saying Zach with how freaking dynamic, like I don't want to see like canted frames of animal freaking out. Like, ah! <laughs> I just want to see animal freaking out, you know, uh, especially with like the, the, I guess I, I don't want to say like sitcom setup, but kind of like sitcom setup where you kind of get a feel of the environment mm -hmm. and everything's about what the characters are doing in the environment. And just because the movement of the Muppets in and of itself is artistic I think that's kind of what makes it very valuable. Obviously, the story is like you could basically summarize it in a sentence. Like, mm -hmm. I think the log line that's on Disney Plus pretty much summarizes it. And the villain is a meme. Yes. Obviously, but that was intentional. So <laughs> it's just like that. I mean, yeah, it's not going to be held to a massive standard. Right. But at the same time, it's just it's it's like a story that exists in the Muppet universe. It's not like a guiding force of the entire like Kermit's 
character development or anything like like Kermit. It is a Kermit movie, like you said, Christian. So, yeah, I definitely really enjoyed it. And it's pretty hard to 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 really think of any better voice actors when it when it comes to the to the stacked freaking cast of of, uh, of voice actors here, uh, just not only of the time, but kind of of all time. Uh, and I just it's really like. I mean, I can't tell that's freaking Yoda, man. Like, it may, maybe <laughs> with uh, uh, freaking um, with Fozzie, right? Isn't Fra- Frank Oz Fozzie? Okay. Yep. He is, yeah. yeah. So other than that, it's kind of hard to tell for me. Uh, but yeah, it's very, very enjoyable. And like, I have like an idea of what all the characters are, and, and I can kind of remember most of their names, but just from other things. Uh, so it was kind of cool just to see like their origin stories. Mm-hmm. So yeah, four out of five. Very nice. I want to ask you real quick, Mitchell, do you know who else, this is just out of pure curiosity, I'm not quizzing you, you don't need to know this. <laughs> Zach, Zach does this to me too, when he asks me about the Dune plot. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> no, this is a lot simpler, I promise. I'm just okay. curious, do you know of any of the other Muppets that Frank Oz plays? That this is, it's okay if you don't. <laughs> this it's is, a, this it's is a bird, scientific, I promise. Miss Piggy. Yes, right? okay. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. That's bird what I was guy, asking. what's his name? Bluebird. Oh, Sam the Eagle. Sam the Eagle. Yeah, well, you're already you. naming more than me. The only two I know off the top of my head are Fozzie and Piggy. I was just curious okay. because I went years watching Muppet stuff uh, without realizing that he played both of them, which mm-hmm. is kind of amazing. <laughs> but in this one, especially in this one, I think it's it's pretty clear that they almost never share a scene with each other and they like never mm-hmm. talk to each other. And once you have that knowledge, it's kind of hard to unsee it in the Muppet Show and in other places. But um, you know what is there. cool, though, and I, I noticed this on this previous Jim Henson voices and puppeteers both Kermit and Ralph. That's right. Um, so in in that one musical, like Ralph is uh, honestly maybe even more tied to Jim Henson than Kermit is. Kermit is kind of the original Muppet. But Ralph mm-hmm. would like appear with Jim Henson on like talk shows. And after Henson died, uh, I mean, a bunch of other people have puppeteered Kermit, but they've never really like totally replaced R- Ralph in the same way. Like he showed up, but he's not, there's not ever been like a wholesale replacement. There's never been like a, this guy's playing Ralph now. So to see in that scene, even if Henson isn't puppeteering both of them, He's doing the voices for both of them. And I don't know if he's doing that in post or live on set, but that's that's a really interesting scene to watch and think about how they manage that. Yeah, definitely. I, the whole, as I feel like as I get older and I keep watching Muppet stuff, my my like consciousness of them being puppeteered by people on, on like a purely factual level gets higher because... I, I'm an emerging adult and I understand these things better now. But I still feel like when I'm watching the movie, I'm not I'm not really thinking, oh, that's Jim Henson or, or Frank Oz is doing that. Even mm-hmm. the same way, like when I'm watching an action blockbuster and I'm like, oh, that's just CGI. For some reason, I feel like the sort of secret sauce of the Muppets being puppets voiced and, mm-hmm. and uh, moved around by other people somehow is less apparent to the viewer, uh, even a viewer that knows that perfectly well. I, I think that for whatever reason, it's just a purer effect than, than a lot of other things. Um, mm-hmm. Of course, the uh, the human players in Muppet movies are, are quite important. Uh, mm-hmm. In large part, I've talked about this on our Empire Strikes Back episode uh, way long ago, but to part of what makes a puppet so convincing is the human alongside the puppet basically treating it as if it were a person and giving mm-hmm. it that sense of realism. So we've got Charles Durning as mm-hmm. Doc Hopper, who is like the guy that you recognize but have no idea what, what he's been in. I swear he's the most familiar-looking face. Apparently he was yes. in Dog Day Afternoon and Oh Brother yeah. Where Art Thou and The Sting, among other things. Um, <laughs> we've got a whole host of comedian uh, cameos, a few of whom I know Mitchell greatly enjoyed. So yeah, of course. Um, and of course, the yarmulke. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> and Orson Welles, who yes, gosh, I'm just, yeah. I just think it's so cool that he was willing to do that. Who has one line, <laughs> <laughs> but he eats it up. He just like, yeah. 
he 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 takes a puff and he he gives them that glance and a born yeah. performer. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll see more of Orson Welles later in this season. Who knows? Mm. <laughs> what did you all make of of our human counterparts? I think Charles Durning probably makes the biggest impression. He's, I mean, he's definitely a star of the 70s, but I, I don't think, he's not really giving a, a cameo here. Um, mm -hmm. I guess you could call it an extended cameo, but he's a, a real character, whereas a lot of the other celebrities who show up are there to be, hey, it's Telly Savalas. Hey, it's uh, Dom DeLuise, you know. Um <laughs> So, and I, I do think he really plays it well. I'm trying to think of any modern actor you could compare him to, but I, I'm i really drawing a blank. I mean, like you said, he's in Dog Day Afternoon. He's in I Walk the Line. Like, he's in all these 70s classics. He's in a lot of Coen Brothers movies. He's in um, The Hudsucker Proxy, too, I think. He's... Um, huh. He's... Uh, Hudsucker, I think. He's the one who jumps out the window um, <laughs> and reappears as an angel. Um, Spoilers! Oh, yeah, no. he's, he's, he's a real star. Um, and he brings that same energy to this. I think people, when people talk about the best kind of Muppet uh, human players in a film, they, they often bring up uh, Michael Caine from Christmas Carol, and they bring up Tim Curry in Treasure Island. And based on those two, they kind of, people sort of define, well, there's two ways that you can be a human performer in a Muppet movie. You can either treat all of the other Muppets as if they're just your fellow actors and you're you're doing a traditional production, um, which is kind of the Michael Caine approach. Or you can act like you yourself are also a Muppet <laughs> and belong in this absurd <laughs> scenario, which is what Tim Curry kind of does in Treasure Island. And I think Charles Durning kind of falls in the middle of those two techniques because he's not going full goof, but you're not going to see that guy in Shakespeare. That's, uh, uh, you know, Doc Hopper really only exists in the world of the Muppets. And I kind of like that. There's so many details of this movie that are really over the top and absurd. And people, I think, have this rose tinted perspective of the movie because it is this treasured piece of nostalgia now. But I, looking back on it, especially considering the context of The Muppet Show, which The Muppet Show was on for a few years and then they made this. And I know, uh, Christian, that you had said that Kermit in this movie doesn't quite have, you know, this is before he's been defined as the one who cracks all the other, cracks the whip and gets all the other Muppets in order. But he'd been doing that on The Muppet Show for a few years at this point. So I, I do feel like, I don't know, part of me wonders if this movie is almost meant to be like a parody of a biopic. If this is like <laughs> the walk hard yeah. of, uh, of of the 70s and it's like the a, a deliberately fake like mockumentary, a deliberately absurd like bohemian rhapsody type movie about like this is how we got the band together uh it's it's just something that occurred to me on this on this watch where i was like yeah this is because this is not the way the muppets behave on the show they're not yeah. this nice to each other a lot of the time <laughs> it's funny that you mentioned that zach because when you describe that sort of framing i think of monty python on the holy grail pretty much where it's so <laughs> mm -hmm. absurdly self-aware and it pretty much is like a mockumentary or in that case it's like a just like, you know, a parody of epics, uh, of medieval epics. Mm -hmm. And I think that's pretty much what's going on here. It's like a Dumb and Dumber or <laughs> National Lampoon or something like that. And I think uh, everything is guided by like, they have to get to the next, or the SpongeBob movie, the original <laughs> one. But <laughs> they get to each like part, they get to each place, and then something kicks them out of that place, and they get to the next place until they finally get to their destination. That's the entire framework. And, uh, I just think having that ha having that dynamic of the puppet. I'll, I'll actually bring this back to what Christian was saying, so I don't get too off off the rails of this train. <laughs> no worries. Uh, train track, but um, with I would say with the human characters, uh, who framed Roger Rabbit is kind of what Zach was saying about like the the black and white. Like there's e they're either going to be a tune or they're going to pretend like <laughs> they're all humans, and I, I really enjoy that dynamic. Um, honestly, I don't think the human characters are that. I mean. I think I think it's more of the irony that carries their characters than the actual 
characters themselves. Like, it's just funny to see those actors playing in, in those roles. And I, I, maybe that's like the essential definition of a cameo. But maybe that is kind of proving that it's just an extended cameo, like kill kill frog or use him as as commercial <laughs> advertisement. That is, is the whole goal. But I mean, I just think it exists to have a conflict to push it forward. And I think that is safe. It's totally fine. And I think it works in this in this particular context. In a normal context, I think it would be really dumb. So um, that just makes this a lot yeah. more unique. I think there are times where the cameos are just a little dated inevitably. And I don't mm. think that's as bad of a thing as it would be in other places, especially because the Muppet show and I think almost any Muppet movie has has these cameos baked in as almost a tradition of the ensemble. But like when, mm -hmm. when Ed Bergen shows up, I'm like, oh, okay, so that's Ed Bergen, the famous ventriloquist. And, but then I have like no connection to him and the camera like even lingers on him for like a couple seconds longer than I feel like it needed to. And then Richard Pryor shows up and I'm like, oh, I guess that's Richard Pryor. I know none of his work at all. I just know he exists, um, <laughs> which is fine. And there, I'm sure there are a few others where I just genuinely didn't know was a celebrity uh -huh. comedian. But of course... Sounds like I, you're just uncultured, son. I, I do think <laughs> it's worth pointing out, though, like most of the time when there's a cameo, I think the joke isn't, oh, it's fill in the blank. Like th there's, a, there's a cameo. But then in that cameo, they make a joke as well. So there's like a purpose mm -hmm. to that character existing. Um, yeah, I do it. I do enjoy it. It's not just like a background character. Hey, look, it's that person. Yeah. They actually have some, you know. I, I will agree leverage. that the, the Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy one is kind of just there to be, oh, it's Edgar. Ber like they're, they're, they're not even yeah. playing characters. They are just Edgar Bergen and Charlie <laughs> McCarthy. But I, I don't know. For, for me, that kind of that kind of resonated with me because I do think. I mean, hands up, kids. How many of our youthful listeners know who <laughs> Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy are? Let's get that hashtag going. Um, but like, even though those two are not relevant in any way anymore, I do think it's interesting to see them in the movie. And they were guests on the show at one point because I think those two are really symbols of a of a time when entertainment was viewed in a very, very different way that I think the Muppets are kind of a last bastion of, where the whole thing with ventriloquism, really, I, and Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy is, like, it doesn't really, it doesn't matter if it looks real, like, as long as you are entertained and having fun. Um, and the Muppets, if you look at a Muppet, no one's going to go, well, by golly, that's a <laughs> living being. But the point is that you're having fun, and if you are having fun, you're kind of, you're sucked into it. Yeah, that's that's a good point. I, I was going to give a different defense, but I think that one's even better. So, <laughs> <laughs> I think Paul Williams' music is really something I didn't expect in a few ways. One being that Rainbow Connection opens the the film. It feel, it feels like such a closer to me, probably in part because of its use in the 2011 soft reboot and its existence as this sort of perennial Muppet song. Uh, but the rest of the soundtrack has got this kind of honky tonk energy to it mm -hmm. that is like country, but not really. And it's just fun and different from, I don't know, like any sort of even Disney musical from around that time period, let alone like an, an older like adaptation of a, of a stage Broadway show or, or anything. It just feels very fresh and very sincere in that way. And I was in particular touched by, uh, Gonzo's solo towards the end when they yeah. think they're not going to make it and he he gives this just beautifully croaky um it's just it's just a sublime I, I listened to it again after finishing the movie today and it was it just made me smile because he is going to get there someday you know <laughs> yeah I think I, I really like um uh oh it's is it just called something better the the Ralph and Kermit song. That sounds um, right. Yeah. Because that's just, it's barely even a joke. It just works as an actual song. It's like, a, <laughs> I don't know, it's like a Tom Waits song or something. Like the it, watching The Muppet Show, some of the best segments are when Ralph just sits down and there's no joke and he just plays and sings a song. Because <laughs> yes. the, the, the character really works for that kind of thing. Um, and 
when there's a joke in it, it's really funny. I think the the best gag in the Muppet Show I've seen so far is the very first episode. He sings a song called "You and Me and George" about a, a <laughs> double about a date with a third wheel who falls into a river and drowns himself. <laughs> um, but like, it doesn't need that because it's just fun to see Ralph play the piano. I love Ralph. He's... Electric mayhem. Yes. <laughs> Dr. Teeth. Not Presbyterians. <laughs> <laughs> I'd forgotten. Yeah, that was that's, all, that's all I have to say. <laughs> that's all the I only ones say. I, uh, I re- clearly remembered were in it were uh, Rainbow Connection and Moving Right Along. And everything else was kind of a pleasant surprise from there. I think the mm-hmm. one criticism I might have of the music is kind of shockingly... Uh, I don't think Frank Oz was a very good singer at this point, even in the sort of mm. Muppety style. Um, in, in both Fozzie's song and Fozzie's um, uh, America the Beautiful, is that what he sings? <laughs> <laughs> the joke is that he doesn't sound good. <laughs> okay, well then I'll excuse Come on, that. Miss, Miss Piggy is the most perfect singer in the whole movie. <laughs> I, I, there I'll, were a I will couple times one, where, yeah. where Piggy, was, <laughs> Piggy was dipping and I was cringing. I was like, I think this is pushing the, the puppet style into the uh, <laughs> flat style a bit too hard, Frank. But, um, <laughs> he's fixed, he fixed that up in, in later movies, I think. Um, I, I'm interested, though, by Piggy. The way they handle Piggy in this movie is so different from The Muppet Show, even, and, mm-hmm. and the other films because... She, and, and everything else, she's pretty much constantly pining after Kermit. And maybe this is sort of a an offshoot of, of the mockumentary style that, that you were suggesting earlier, Zach. But she there's that initial like love at first sight moment with Kermit, or at least on, mm-hmm. on her side, or lust or something at first sight. <laughs> <laughs> all, all of it. <laughs> and she, you know, follows him and is persistent. But then at, at some point, she, she gets that call from her agent that, that they've booked a commercial for her, and it's enough money for her to just leave Kermit in a lurch and say, well, bye, and just leave. And, you know, she does come back and, and whatever. But, um, and maybe that's just the setup to the Rolf song that we were just talking about, too. Mm-hmm. But I do think there's little moments and, and edges to Piggy and Kermit's relationship that, it, that are interesting and maybe not consistent with, even though their relationship has always been rocky, I feel like she's always the one kind of pushing it more, more so than mm-hmm. Kermit. I don't know. Calm down, son. They're just puppets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I do feel like there should be more girl Muppets. I, I will say that. Yeah, there's maybe three. There's Janice mm-hmm. and Miss Piggy. and Camilla. Camilla the Camilla. Chicken. Yes, the chicken. Thank Camilla you. the chicken. The chicken is a girl. Okay. <laughs> there's, um, uh, yeah, there's like random bystander like female Muppets. And in the yeah. 2014 show, there's like Kermit's rebound pig after he and Miss Piggy break up. But uh, we all have our preferences. <laughs> yeah. There's a couple other like um, miscellaneous pig women in like the 90s too. Anyway, I digress. Yes, miscellaneous okay. pig women is my favorite punk <laughs> band. Um, <laughs> it is interesting, though, that the, the movie really doesn't... Like, it sets up this grand romance between the two of them, and the poster is even like a parody of Gone with the Wind um, that seems to imply that this movie is going to be about the two of them. But I guess that's important in the second act, and it really really doesn't contribute all that much to the to the conclusion or the climax. Um, so it, it is a, it is a fair point. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> what did you guys mm-hmm. make of, I've, I've already poked fun at the Orson Welles, um, moment, but does it bother you at all that they just get there and then they get the contract? <laughs> uh, no, I'm trying to think why it doesn't bother me. And I, I think it's partially because. The Muppets are kind of so sincere and so innocent. And I think they they represent, especially this film, represents a very different time and a very different view on, like I said, on like entertainment and quote unquote the industry where 
maybe big dreams were a little more possible and seemed a little more attainable if uh, if you had, you know, if you had friends. Um, and I, I think the movie does a good job of kind of propping that idea up, even if it's in no way realistic. But I, I don't expect the, the Muppet movie to be realistic in its portrayal of the entertainment industry in, <laughs> you know, in 2024. When this movie was made like <laughs> over 40 years ago. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, like narratively, it's a little it's a little bit. Eh, really but if you see the movie as kind of like a like a grand quest and that's like the the x marks the spot at the end then then i don't know i don't know where i'm going with this metaphor orson wells is the x <laughs> um <laughs> and they've they've reached the point so they've reached the spot they've reached they've literally reached the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow as the <laughs> the final shot establishes um, mm -hmm. the obstacles were, were getting there. There's no like dragon to face at the end, unless you count the secretary with Alex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's like, it would have been very disappointing if they had a plastic kid pail, like pail and shovel, like little trowel <laughs> trying to dig at the X instead of just a regular shovel. So I think, I think that's, that, that would be pretty frustrating. Uh, yeah, I, I just think it's, they've spent a lot of time with, Focusing on well, first of all, they're getting out of that whole that whole German experiment scenario, and then <laughs> th then you had Miss Piggy leaving, so that's another like depressive thing to happen, and and there's so many conflicts that were already resolved up to that point, and then obviously Animal getting big, so <laughs> you have a lot of like recurring setbacks, and I think at this point they had earned they had earned the pot of gold. Mm. And that's what I'll say. Mitchell, you mentioned animal getting big. This just reminds me of a factoid I read about the other day that I just have to mention. <laughs> yes. When when Annabel, when Annabel, when Hannibal um, gets yes. on an elephant, when uh, when when Spoiler. Animal grows to gigantic size during the climax, for yeah. the wide shots in that scene, they built a gigantic puppet head of of Animal that they put on wow. top of the saloon building, and apparently nobody knows where it went. <laughs> Like nobody has any idea what happened to it. At this point, it's probably like deteriorated or been thrown away. But nobody is even like, "Oh yeah, we took that." But like, nobody has any idea where it went at all. It was pretty big. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> where would you even store such a thing? I don't know. <laughs> That's pretty silly. There's gonna That's be bizarre. like, there's gonna be an episode of American Pickers one day where they open the barn of some guy in Iowa. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I got that when I went to Hollywood in 1979. <laughs> well, yeah. I think I've, I've covered most of the bases, but I wanted to ask you two different questions. Um, mm -hmm. Zach, where the film okay. ranks in your Muppet ranking and why? And Mitchell, how likely are you to uh, experience more sensational Muppetational feature films in the future? <laughs> Muppetational. Okay. <laughs> Well, I actually have an, an, a real Muppet ranking list that I'm, I'm going to try and find right now. So, Mitchell, do you want to take your question first and I'll uh, I'll do some digging? <laughs> yeah, we'll say I'm like in the next year, like 40 percent sure. <laughs> in the next five, 85 percent sure. All right. I like those numbers. It's, it's important to quantify it. Yeah, no, that's that's an important frame because there are plenty of yes. things on my watch list that I fully intend to get to, and they've been sitting there for five years. So, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> well, there you go. I'll have to move the uh, soft reboot up on the uh, Cookie Pocket release calendar. Maybe. Yeah. Or you could just disregard my feelings and just put it <laughs> in the season, <laughs> and then, then I can't avoid it. All right. I, I finished scrolling. Um Right now, this one is at the top of my Muppet ranking list. Um, after this most recent watch, hmm, I, I don't know if it belongs there. I, I, I got to oh. ruminate a little more. Um, oh. Because I do think, I do think Muppet Treasure Island is a pretty amazing movie. Tim um, Curry is so good in that one. And is maybe like a better motion picture 
than than the Muppet movie in terms of in terms of uh, technical requirements. But there is just there's kind of a there is a secret sauce about this film. There's a there's a real mm-hmm. sentimentality and tone and earnestness about it that I don't think any other Muppet movie really strikes again. So it's it's definitely an interesting question. Um, and I think it depends on which way the wind's blowing when I when I watch a Muppet movie. Am I going for something that's funny and and also just feels like they plopped Muppets in the middle of like Pirates of the Caribbean? <laughs> or, or am I going for something that's really going to tug at my heartstrings and by the closing number, it will convince me the world is a better place? We'll, we'll see. <laughs> Fair enough. I don't think I have a, a definitive ranking of my own, but I've seen them. So I, especially now that I've got this one fresh in my mind, maybe I'll have to go and do that. So listener, by the time this comes out, maybe I'll have a, a list on Letterboxd that you're e- eager to read and discover. Yeah. <laughs> and well, listener, Muppets Most Wanted is better than you remember. It's very, very good. True. Watch it again. <laughs> that is true. I, I co-signed that. And I was a doubter in the past. So Zach reformed <laughs> me. He can reform you too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Well, shall we... Uh, Review our collective weeks. Sure. Any yeah. closing thoughts? Yes. I don't know. Cool. Yes. Well, you guys have a, a, a shared bill. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. It's, it sounds like it. Um, because I watched <laughs> Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind this morning, and Mitchell, you said you watched it uh, a couple days ago. Yeah. I don't know how that happened. I was on Letterbox. I was like, "What did I do to make Zach watch this?" And there was nothing. <laughs> so I don't know how that happened, but. Yeah, I picked it up from the library. Um, I, I, I figured, mm. I think I saw this one years and years ago, um, but I, I, I didn't have a review of it. I didn't really remember it at all beyond the general aesthetics and some of the performers who were in it. So I figured it was time I gave it a rewatch. I did read the script, I think, in mm. my freshman year of college for a, for a class, um, but I don't even remember that that well. Because while I was watching it, there were things that I thought, is that different in the script? But I, I, I couldn't remember that well. Um, I, I personally really enjoy the film. And I do think I mentioned in my letterbox review that it's really interesting to see how they marketed it in, I think, did it come out in 2004? Or am I going too early on that? Whenever it came out. No, that sounds right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The, the trailers for the movie, I, I, can, I can just picture somebody at Focus Features going, oh, my God, how do we market this? <laughs> Um, yeah, because it's not they're not trying to make it look like a typical Jim Carrey comedy. Uh, like they're not stressing slapstick or anything, but the it's it's kind of a typical like feel good trailer. It's full of like people dancing and actors breaking into like big toothy smiles and close ups with like their name popping up on screen. Jim yeah. Carrey, Kate Winslet. <laughs> and it, it's yeah, it doesn't feel accurate to the the tone of the film at all, which is. Like a lot of Charlie Kaufman projects, very mm-hmm. genuine and very sad and honest. Um, I think it's really interesting that throughout the movie, you're you're definitely rooting for these these two people to get back together, or at least find a way to coexist, even though their relationship looks like it in a lot of ways might not have been very good for for either of them <laughs> by the yeah. point that they eventually did break up, but having some vestige of that relationship or at least remembering some vestige of that relationship is better Mm -hmm. than not having it at all. And I I think it's it's an interesting question that's posed there. I feel like it is so daring and incredible, I would imagine incredibly freaking difficult to try to portray memories correctly. Mm -hmm. And as a major thematic element in a film, because you can have flashbacks and change the color palette to sepia and say, this is in the past. But in this case, they kind of use it as a part of the twist and also, or I guess a twist. And then also most of the importance of, or basically all the importance of the relationship revolves around how they remember it pretty much mm-hmm. like you were saying. And I think that is a very unique concept. And I think they executed it very fairly well. And I think you really have to pay attention to know where we are and in, in things. I mean, there's certain mm-hmm. visual indicators like her hair, which was, was something 
um, that I noticed. And I think that was kind of interesting. But yeah, I, I, I also appreciated like the fact that it's not it doesn't really matter if the relationship lasts or not. Mm-hmm. It just kind of matters how they felt about it. And I think so. I would I would I haven't rated it yet, but I'm probably gonna give it a three and a half. And mm-hmm. I think just because I, I feel like. I want to say it was shoehorned in, but just a lot of the like, oh, we're just erasing memories thing kind of sounds more like a like a blog post or like a, I'm trying to remember what that that blogging site was where they they write like fan fiction and everything. I feel uh, like it's kind of like that. Like, like it would be it belong better Wattpad? in writing than Wattpad. Wattpad works. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, like a like a Wattpad <laughs> romance or something, where it's like, oh, I can't like like. Good that's Lord. where that's where the idea, the main idea of of the director kind of falls for me is when they they keep reiterating that and yeah, it's funny, freaking Kirsten Dunst and Mark Ruffalo, whatever. But <laughs> I just thought it was really overly silly, and and that I understand why they had that side thing with the older doctor and everything, but. I just felt like it was detracting just a, a little too much from the the main the main juice. Uh, but it does come back around at the end, and everything is surprisingly very consistent plot wise. And uh, it was it was a lot more enjoyable than I would have thought. Um, mm-hmm. Definitely more convincing romance than Titanic. Wow. I, mm. So Jeez, I also don't like Titanic that much. No warning. But, <laughs> yeah. Not a huge fan of Titanic. That's what we learned today. That surprises yeah. me. I feel like I don't know. <laughs> That seems like it, it should be up your alley because you've you've got a real appreciation for like the blockbuster things and and even an earnest romance here and there. That's interesting to hear. Hmm. That would be a good mm-hmm. one to talk about mm-hmm. in an episode someday. Maybe we need a tour of James Cameron's works. I'd have a lot to say. <laughs> yeah. That yeah, wouldn't maybe. be that long of a tour. That'd be a pretty pretty attainable tour. Yeah. 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 One last rock to tour. Directorial instead of like producer yes. and all that stuff. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Well, gosh, I hadn't, I haven't seen Eternal Sunshine. I think I watched that at an unreasonable hour in high school, like when I was supposed to be asleep, which is, it's, it's the type of movie that you watch it then, I guess. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, I liked it. I don't know. It's been a while. Uh, more recently, I watched, in an effort to, to catch up and uh, get to Fury Road before I get to Furiosa, I've been watching mm. all of George Miller's Mad Max films, beginning, of course, with the trilogy of Zach's giving an exasperated These expression already. Baffle me, man. I <laughs> <laughs> like I no. get it, but like in a in, in a concerned way. <laughs> I, I knew you would disagree, but not this vehemently. This is interesting. <laughs> um, I watched Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, which is the third and final starring Mel Gibson Mad Max film. And, um, you know, it picks up naturally after Road Warrior and the first one in this trilogy, Mad Max, being sort of its own very low budget thing with a pretty different aesthetic than these uh, last two. Um, Thunderdome has a mixed to not so great reputation of being more childish and less consistent than Road Warrior. And I see where people are coming from for, for some of that, but I found I enjoyed it a lot. And I don't think it's quite as kid kitty as as its reputation suggests. I still think, uh, even in the second half of the film, the settings tend to be pretty grimy and gross, so maybe less than Thunderdome itself. And you know, characters still hurl curse words around. The action is still intense. Somebody gets a harpoon through their thigh. I mean, it's not. I, I would hardly call it PG if if I had Mad Max. I, I would maybe say a hard <laughs> PG thirteen at that and um i thought tina turner was was quite good which was uh fun to see and i even liked the the sort of wacky thunderdome battle when there were just like two trapeze artists <laughs> instead instead of being two like gladiators i thought that was mm-hmm. kind of fun and at least different so maybe it's just the the star warsy part of me and there's definitely i i compared the children and the second half of this film functionally to the ewoks and yeah. the, the film at large to Return of the Jedi, and I do think there's sort of a, a a nicer tone, perhaps, that the two share. But I gave Thunderdome a three and a half. I think that's very fair, an assessment of its faults. And it's my favorite so far. It's the same rating I gave Road Warrior. I know, I know I'm know, i going to be uh, 
looked down upon for this opinion, but I stand by it. <laughs> I I will admit that of the original three, I think that Thunderdome is probably the most polished and professional motion picture. But mm-hmm. to me, mm-hmm. the fun of Mad Max is at least of the original Mad Max and and, and uh, like the original concept of Mad Max is that it, it feels you can feel the low budget and you can feel the sense that at any moment somebody might die in a in a poorly <laughs> oh choreographed God. stunt or car crash. <laughs> like you can really feel <laughs> the tension on, of people risking their <laughs> lives every day. And that doesn't really come across in Thunderdome for me because because of Hollywood and its gosh darn health and safety requirements. <laughs> There's no st- that bit in Road Warrior where that guy flies off the bike and hits his feet on the truck and does like three flips in midair and he like broke his leg in eight places. You're not going to get that in Thunderdome. <laughs> You're not going to get a stuntman almost dying in Thunderdome. I conclude my argument. <laughs> Thanks, Gavin Newsom. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, I've got nothing to say here. Um <laughs> Okay. California is going down the tubes. <laughs> well, oh man, I guess we've the got rundown? the rundown now. Yeah, <laughs> I'm I'm still running. Is that right? That's correct. You're you're, okay. you're mm-hmm. a victim, Zach, for this season. Yeah, I'm gonna eat and your Hollywood legs. Hollywood safety standards aren't here to save you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I better get gone with the Schwinn. <laughs> yes. Oh wow! You've, you're you're right on top of it. Um, you are very silly, Zach. <laughs> yeah. So let's see. I think I'm going first. Is that right? Yes, I'm going first. I don't. I don't know. Okay. Um, Mitchell, can you time this for us, or should I time it? I don't. I forgot how we oh. do this. It's been so long. I'll, I'll time it. I'll time can it. I? We're off to okay. a great start. And I've got this. I've got this. <laughs> <laughs> I swear. <laughs> you can run, but you can't hide, Zach. We're almost there. <laughs> okay. We're starting in three. Two, one, Gone with the Schwinn. Oh, four out of five. Worldwide Studios. Four out of five. Foreign food that doesn't smell promising. <laughs> Two out of five. <laughs> the film's socially redeeming value. Uh, three out of five. French fried frog legs. Two out of five. Songs about rainbows. Five out of five. The Electric Mayhem. Uh, four out of five. Arnie the Alligator. Three out of five. Miss Piggy going bananas. <laughs> three out of five. Electronic Yamaka. Uh, two out of five. <laughs> I'm going to go back there someday. Uh, four out of five. Muppet abuse. <laughs> four out of five. Promising yourself. Uh, four out of five. Businessmen with propositions. Three out of five. Frankly, Miss Piggy, I don't give a hoot. Uh, three out of five. Zoot skipping a groove again. <laughs> uh, four out of five. Statler and Waldorf letterbox reviews. Oh, five out of five. <laughs> Short, green, and handsome. <laughs> three out of five. Reading the screenplay. Four out of five. One second. Swedish Chef Time. Rolling Film. Uh, four out of five. Oh. <laughs> we'll give you that one. Plenty of good ones left. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This was, this was a fun one. Plenty. Mitchell came out uh, blasting. I got his list before I started mine, and I was like, ooh, I got to up my game here. <laughs> well, speaking All of, right. I don't know if you know what there is to, to preview, but I think Mitchell's choosing our next film. Is that right? I think so. I am. Oh. <laughs> Samuel L. Jackson is wasting MFers, and we're going to discuss whether or not those civilians deserve to get murdered. This could be so many <laughs> movies. This could be so many movies. <laughs> welcome, to, welcome to the Middle East. <laughs> uh, okay, we're getting closer. 2000 Rules of Engagement. Okay, there it is. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. I don't want to keep it trail- going too long. I'm not just going on some tangent. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I read this for class and discussed the ethics behind it uh, with respect to the army. So I have an interesting perspective um, and a legal perspective. All right. Christian. Ah, I can get with Let's that. Let's go. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yes. Yeah. Somebody's getting freaking court martialed. <laughs> Let's go. Yeah, this will be interesting because I think William Friedkin is a cookie pocket alum, but I think just for The Exorcist, just for our first yes. holiday yeah. special. So massive whiplash. <laughs> uh, 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 a different, uh, very different film from Billy. Yes, yeah. we've done a good job. Yes, in Tommy Lee Jones of of plugging our, our old episodes today. I'm just realizing we've got a lot of <laughs> lot of fun allusions here and there, and yeah, yes, I'll look forward to that one. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. All right. Well, I guess that's it. Um, yeah. Keep dreaming, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Join us next Bye. time. See ya. Bye. Bye, folks. See you in the next one. Bye.